I'm not going on camera. I am not going on camera. Okay, I won't do it. And Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're going to look at the role of religion in the Morphew case and specifically how the beliefs of Barry and I guess some of his other family members, the close family members, played into the circumstances of this crime. Now, I understand... Um, this is a delicate subject. If you someone who's going to be triggered by talk about religion, then you should probably not watch this video. Um, if you someone who's triggered by politics, you should also probably not be watching it. But bear in mind, if you know true crime, you know that it's just quite simple. Beliefs do very much play into motive. Um, I'm talking about your philosophy, your psychology. Is, is, is wrapped up a lot in what you generally believe. So beliefs and politics play a lot into, into motive. The question is how? And so we're going to be dealing with that in this episode, dealing with some of the statements Barry's made and other family members have made specifically about their faith. Once again, I think it's necessary to invoke the intertextual aspect. It's important to look at other crimes other scenarios, other cases where religion was also a factor. Um, Chris Watts has turned to God and, you know, you sort of hear about family members extending forgiveness early on. Um, you have, the, I think you even had something like that happening in court at the sentencing hearing um, where the guy's about to be sentenced and the victim's mother's talking about, uh, may God forgive you kind of thing. Well, should the court, should the court forgive him? Then the McCanns are also a very interesting family that uh, regularly go to church and rely on, on sort of that side of things. And, and then the Ramses as well. Um, it's, it's something that comes up quite a lot in true crime. It's also present in the Oscar Pistorius case. And interestingly, the creator Plunder has just made a pretty good video um, about a golden child. What do you think that whole psychology is about, where, where you have the son in a family that is that is seen or um, regarded or becomes the golden child? Well, what it is, is it's sort of giving not maybe official divinity, but a, a kind of bestowed um, sense of, um, of value that, that th this particular person perhaps thinks that they are worth more than somebody else and what sort of entitlements flow from that that thing where your family members think that you can do no wrong right so that is the subject matter of this episode if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel please do like share leave a comment and let's get started so we spoke a little bit about premeditation in saturday's live thank you to those who participated in that thank you for those who contributed to that and so in this episode, you know, what actually kind of occurred to me uh, was I was reading the book, The Last Kingdom by Bernard Cornwell. It's about Uhtred of Bebenberg. It's the uh, book on which the amazing series on Netflix, The Last Kingdom, is based. And in chapter four of Cornwell's book, he talks about Uhtred, who is, who is originally a... Um, an English fellow, someone who's actually born in England, but he becomes a Dane. He talks about him um, hearing about the um, the whole, you know, the, the religious scenario for for his folk, his kinsmen, meaning the, the English. And, and he finds it dull. He finds it boring. He finds the whole thing that you're going to spend the rest of your, in heaven, you're going to spend your, your life on a high platform in God's great hall, singing God's praise. And he just can't, he, he finds that boring. He says, you know, to, to be doing that forever, just singing. Um, you know, the priest said that that would be an ecstatic existence, but he says, to me, it seemed very dull. And then, but he found the Danish um, attitude to life, the, the, the vigorousness of it, the you know, just the excitement of it, the adventure, 
you know, plundering, um, going by ship from um, one town to the other, um, you know, the whole thing he found far more interesting. And then the, 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 the Danes, the Vikings attitude to the life after death was that dead warriors would be carried to Valhalla and there they would spend their days fighting. So heaven for, the, for a Viking was fighting in the day and at night feasting and swiving. I'm not quite sure what that means. But he, he was thinking that's a much more fun way of spending eternity than just singing to the sound of golden harps. And he felt that he had to sort of keep that a secret from the people around him, certainly the English. Um, and so in a weird way, he had the beliefs or the he um, gravitated towards the beliefs of a Viking, even though he was English. And so in a weird way, that made him more Viking than it made him English. But it also kind of made him a hybrid because ultimately he favored the English and he tried to help them and he fought for them. But they nevertheless judged him and, and um, kind of gave him a very hard time, those who know the story. And I couldn't help wondering when I listened to this whether Barry may have shared the same sentiments just in the sense of um, being in a household that was quite pious and just feeling not quite as pious perhaps as his wife or even his daughters. It's difficult to know this for sure. You'd need to really ask his daughters to get a sense of that. Um, you know, was he a regular churchman? If he was, well, what was he like at home kind of thing? And if you look at some videos of the interior of the house, you don't really get a sense that it's overt. You don't really get a sense that they are devout. Although there is a sense that the folks in Indiana are or were devout, right? But you do also get a sense that um, religion or Christianity hangs over this case far more so, for example, than the Chris Watts case, certainly during the summer that the events played out. Um, so what I think is really fascinating are some of the statements Barry himself has made to the media invoking God's name. One of them is, where he says, and this is quoted by Fox 21, saying, quote, This is the most devastating thing that has ever happened to me, but I've got to keep my faith and trust in God. And Suzanne, and Suzanne trusted the Lord, and if one person got saved from this, she would think it was worth it. And we are just a godly, loving, caring family, and this thing is just a tragedy, end quote. Now that is, you know, we did a statement analysis previously, but this is also a fascinating statement where he's, he's almost turning Suzanne's disappearance. He's almost, I wouldn't say weaponizing it, but he's sort of altering it. Um, he's transforming it into almost like a parable or a religious lesson. He's kind of saying, you know what, if um, Suzanne's missing and if we just keep the faith, and if one person can get saved from this whole peer experience, if one person can learn to have faith in God, you know, in the absence of evidence, then, then, it, then it would be worth it. I mean, what the hell is that about? Let me read that again. This is the most devastating thing that has ever happened to me. But I've got to keep my faith and trust in God. And Suzanne trusted the Lord. And if one person got saved from this, she would think it was worth it. Now, what he's doing is he's saying, he's almost putting words into Suzanne's mouth. He's saying, Suzanne trusted the Lord, shouldn't you? He's also saying, if one person gets saved from this, she, meaning Suzanne, would think it was worth it. Really? Do you think Suzanne would think what happened to her was worth it? Do you think Suzanne would think um, her disappearance, death, murder was worth it? Do you think Suzanne would agree with what her husband's saying here? I don't. And do you think uh, where he says, we are just a godly, loving, caring family? I don't know if that's true. I don't know if they are just that. I think there's something more than that. Um, and he, you know, I don't know whether the, the how many of those words are, are true. I, I wonder what Suzanne would say about that. Were there a godly family? Was bury a godly husband towards the end and I did a video at one point on unequally yoked and I think probably the major area where they possibly weren't 
equally yoked was in the area of the genuine beliefs in um, in God, in Christianity. I think in that area, especially if if you consider that Barry may be responsible, that would make it actually explicit how far Barry had fallen or, you know, um, from wherever it was that he once was. It also may just be that Barry was reclaiming his destiny in the sense that, well, he wants to be a golden child again. He doesn't want to go gently into the good night and kind of, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, the uh, creative plunder is also going into an area that I think is really important, doing research on Barry's business um, relationships, his business dealings, insurance, all that kind of thing. I think that is a key area because how can the golden child fail at something like something as basic as being a breadwinner, right? How can the golden child struggle in something as basic as um, doing his job and, and kind of being a success, especially when he's giving the appearance that that's going on? And you have this theme of golden child and then dysfunction side by side in the Scott Peterson case. Scott Peterson was also a golden child. He was also not hacking it in his fertilizer salesman job. He was also in debt and struggling and needing money and his wife had jewelry and an inheritance that he wanted to get his paws onto. In the um, Chris Watts case, um, he was also to some extent the golden child. Certainly he was very well thought of. He was well thought of by his classmates and his teachers. I think to some extent more so than Shanann was. He was also well regarded for a period by his own parents, by friends. Um, but it, it was sort of a, a fairly quiet golden child scenario. People just liked him. He was likable. And um, he just seemed, he was sort of the nice guy golden child. But then behind the scenes, also struggling with his marriage, struggling with um, debt and a, and a house that they couldn't afford, struggling to keep up appearances, and then what happens, right? And so you have this again and again. Another example of a golden child is O.J. Simpson. Another example of a golden child is Oscar Pistorius. And what, is, what do forces such as finances and debt and love and unrequited love and, you know, um, meeting meeting somebody else, some some other... Um, uh, woman crossing paths, what impact does it have on those um, dynamics, those entitlements, right? Something else that was that appeared on Fox 21, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, I can't say for sure who said this. I'm not sure if it was a friend of Suzanne's or her sister, but she said, quote, I pray for Suzanne and for Mel, Macy and Barry that the truth will come out regardless of what that truth is. We have assurance that if Suzanne has already passed away from this earth, that we will see her again in heaven. And, end quote. And so that assurance is obviously coming from a pastor. We do see grace ministries coming up again and again. Um, that, I think that was the church that they attended. I think Suzanne was quite um, involved in the church and that church. And I think... Um, people have not really watched my videos on cancer and I do think cancer is going to turn out to be a very big part of this. In, For example, the sense that what happens when someone gets cancer for that person? You might look at that person and say, okay, shame, you got cancer, you know, good luck. But if you the person with cancer, what is going to happen? Well, probably you're going to turn to God. You're going to turn to um, you're going to want support from somewhere, whether it's your doctor, your your therapist, your husband, or your family. But but you probably are going to be quite earnest in your um, in your faith. And I wouldn't be surprised if Suzanne's faith grew a lot closer, and possibly at the same time, Barry's, if there was still much to begin with, perhaps went in another direction. And perhaps Barry used that time as an opportunity to stray. Who knows? And so that would create this huge dichotomy is, is the one spouse becoming closer to God and the other something else. 
And I sort of want to conclude this episode by quoting Barry saying, we don't know why God does what he does, but we have to trust him. And I just find that almost laughable. Um, did God do this? Did God Was God responsible for what happened to Suzanne or was somebody else responsible? And if somebody else was responsible, was that Barry? And if it was Barry, should we trust him? Should we trust God if Barry was responsible or should we trust Barry if Barry was responsible? And I think something that's just quite ironic is in Plunder's last video about the golden child, she actually mentioned um, a family member, um, I think it's a stepbrother, Thomas or someone, um, saying that, I think I heard correctly, that, that Barry was like God. I don't know whether it means that he was so dominant or so controlling or just so admired or just such a kind of patriarch raised above everyone else. But um, if Barry was like God to his family members, wasn't he playing God? If Barry was sort of um, lifted up and, you know, if you almost imagine a sports star that is sort of on the shoulders of everyone else, like O.J. Simpson was at one point, or Oscar Pistorius waving the flag, if he sort of lifted up and and worshipped in the way that celebrities are today, but just kind of admired and just given a lot of admiration, and you know, you and you can have a scenario like that with a big fish in a small pond. Um, he can do no wrong. Uh, he gets all sorts of favors and perks, and things come easily to him. But then he eventually will expect things to come easy to him. And so when he struggles, that becomes a crisis. I can't be struggling with my work. I can't have a business go south. I've got to, um, I'm the golden child. I can't be in this embarrassing situation. And so, you know, a golden child is a little bit like a holy child. So I want to come back to what I said right in the beginning is that Beliefs inform politics and politics can inform motives and motives are probably going to be very um, uh, pertinent to this case, which means so are politics and beliefs. And I can just feel that the triggering going on. The important thing is to look into this case, not to look at how it reflects on you or what position you think I'm taking. It's simply... Um, let's look at this case, look at Barry Morphy and say, what do you think Barry's beliefs were? What do you think Barry's pol politics were? And what do you think Barry's motives were? And um, I'm not going to go too much further into that, but I do think if you, even if you take the politics out of it, if you take his beliefs, um, his, his, his beliefs uh, in terms of um, how he sees... God and also how he sees himself then that can definitely play potentially play into motive and what I mean by that is um, if he sees God as something useful to him meaning oh we've got to trust God you know trust God and don't think about this case uh, we don't know why this happened so, so trust God and then his belief in himself as a as a mountain man and so on do you see what I'm getting at? It's kind of a cynical belief in something that um, other people perhaps may naively believe. And, and does he not want to encourage that? Does he not want to encourage those naive beliefs? Um, the McCanns, very shortly after the disappearance of their daughter, went and actually had an audience with the Pope. And that was a big... Um, a big bonus to them. The fact that that happened, that they, that they got photographed with the Pope apparently blessing them. And then shortly after that, that incident was removed from the papal website. And so you can borrow strength from um, other people's faith in God in a scenario where you actually need evidence and you need an explanation. And in the lack of that, you can say, no, 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 just trust me. Just have faith um, and forgive me. Don't judge me. Well, all of that really plays into a criminal's, um, it, it plays into their, into their scheme, right? 
The other thing I just want to mention is if you think about um, the crucifixion, you think about the the, the symbol and the, the whole scenario in in um, in Christianity. You have thorns that come from a tree or a, um, a bush. You have a spear that is made out of wood and metal. You have the Savior of the world crucified on a tree. And all of this happens on a mountain called Golgotha, which is known as the place of the skull. And what I've been trying to emphasize throughout is, to some extent, how ancient memory can revisit us in the present in ways that we can't imagine. And so, so much of what is present in this particular case are trees. And how do you, um, what do you do with trees if, if it's your job to work with trees? You reshape them, you cut them down, you burn them, you varnish them, you mold them, you crush them, right? There's so much that, that is done. You use them to landscape, you uproot, you replant. And when you do that again and again, what sort of, what psychology does that teach? What belief does that teach? And trees have seasons. Trees um, give fruit and then they fall into decay. Some trees get sick and need to be chopped down. And if you look at what happened in terms of uh, Christ's journey was that he was eventually nailed to the wood of a tree on some, somewhere on the mountain, right? And so I do wonder whether the psychology in this case doesn't come all the way, go all the way back to when Barry was a little boy, this blonde-haired little boy who was very much controlled by his own father. His father shaped him. His father was almost like um, this um, godlike, all-powerful godlike figure, you know, and he did his father's bidding. But then when his father was no longer there, then doesn't he become, um, or doesn't he want to become, or doesn't he want to assume that kind of control? It's all these things that we need to become familiar with, but get a, a really strong psychological handle of it. And we do that by finding out the scenarios that happened in the family, um, uh, incidents where someone lost their temper, words that they actually use in a particular situation, habitual things that they were likely to do. And, and, and all of that is going to address this whole idea of um, did the golden child who was who, who was like a god to some people um, didn't what was he not tempted to play god and i really do think saying things like we don't know why god does what he does we have to trust him is like playing god i do think saying this is the most devastating thing that has ever happened to me but i've got to keep my faith and trust in god and suzanne trusted the lord and if one person got saved from this she would think it was worth it and just look at those words. If one person got saved from this, who's, who, who do you think he's talking about? And I know what he's trying to convey here, but um, if you go within the psychology of this case, isn't it possibly the person who did this got saved from this? Now, I don't know whatever this is. Um, who would think it is worth it? Who would think... This is just a tragedy. And, you know, in the same way that people might roll their eyes and say, how on earth did Chris Watts think he was going to get away with it? Um, I think the whole MLM was something that um, they'd gotten away with for a really long time. Saying things and selling powders and, and, and not paying debts for a really long time. Saying things and no one really checking up. Um, and, you know, he could say something to his wife and she didn't check up and, and he could say something to his mistress. But, you know, that comes from a long line of, of deceit, right? And in this case, um, is there the same thing? Was, was Barry a, an honest guy? Um, was he honest in his business dealings? Was he, was he honest with his, in his friendships? Was he honest just in a general sense? Is Barry an honest guy? If he's not an honest guy, you've got to ask why. What is the root of that dishonesty? What is he trying to prop up? What is he 
what pretense, what appearance is he trying to keep going? And what is really interesting, in, again, in Plunder's video, she talks about, you know, this is next level that you've got to, you can do something like this, but then the acting that follows it, um, that's next level. So where did that come from? Well, doesn't it come from being the golden boy? Doesn't it come from being the the celebrity way back when when you were a, when you were a baseball star, and and keeping up that act all along, but then eventually the act becoming almost like a curse. Well, people are going to expect me to be um, a success, even when things aren't going so well. And so, is it so surprising that that Barry chooses to make that Facebook video? of himself was that acting was that preaching was that a sermon in the forest was that somebody playing god so i'm not going to take it further than that uh, this week we are waiting anxiously upon or, or for the the release of the uh, affidavit it, it is due out any day now so we're going to be watching that like a hawk um, i think quite a few channels are as well um, this channel is going to be um, taking you through the affidavit when it comes out step by step. So it'll be won't be the whole affidavit in one go. It'll be um, a section at a time. So maybe five episodes or whatever dealing with each segment of it. So if you're interested in that, if you like that sort of uh, walk through um, an analysis, um, then uh, then. Uh, keep an eye on this channel if you haven't subscribed please do like share leave a comment and i'll see you guys next time